say, he said, it's, it's, very, it's part of a Muslim's behavior to be nice to your mother. Right? So you actually get different versions of the same report, even though the, the original report was, was, was only one thing. And all the different versions generally get the same meaning, although they might actually be uh, some important shades of distinction. Right? Um, and this is the difference between a tradition and a narration. When we talk about a tradition, this is the general thing the Prophet said. This is the general report he said. The narrations are the different manifestations and versions of that that we find in the different hadith collections. So, uh, here's a, just a, an example of how complicated this can get. This is one hadith, right? Oh, this is way too small. There's no way you're going to be able to read it, is it? Okay, I'll read it to you then. So, don't worry about the details. You can just see the, the complexity. All these things, here's the prophet here, all these are different chains of transmission that go, lead to different books. And you can see some of them go through the same people and then branch out later on. Some of them start from different companions. All these people heard the prophet say something like, Our Lord descends each night to the lowest level of heavens in the last third of the night and says, Who will call upon me that I may answer? Who will ask me that I may give? Who, will, uh, seek, who seeks my forgiveness that I may forgive them? There's another version which says, Indeed God, says, God bides his time until when a third of the night has passed, he descends to the lowest heaven and says, Is there anyone seeking forgiveness? Is there anyone seeking penance? Is there anyone seeking etc., 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 until the dawn breaks? Or another version says, God descends to the lowest heaven during the second half or the last third of the night and says, Who will call upon me? So you have all these different versions, and they differ on when this actually happens. When does God descend? Is it during the first third of the night, or is it during the last third of the night, or is it during the second half of the night? But the general meaning is the same, which is God comes down closer to the human beings, and to, to, to answer the, the prayers of those people who stayed up awake at that time of night, right? So in general, if you stay up at night, God is going to be more attentive to your, to, your, to your prayers because you've sort of demonstrated your piety and your commitment by doing this. Just to be clear, um, this doesn't mean that God actually physically moves. A lot of people understand this as meaning that God is coming closer to us in the sense that he's going to respond to our prayers. Right? Uh, sometimes these differences in, in narrations can have a big legal impact or a big impact in, in how we understand the value that the Hadith is telling us or is teaching us. There's a very, the most famous hadith is Man Whoever misrepresents me intentionally, let him prepare for himself a seat in hellfire. So the Prophet is saying, whoever lies about me intentionally, this is something that's going to send this person to hell. The most famous hadith. It depends on, uh, on which scholar you ask, there's anywhere, anywhere between 60 to 100 companions who narrated this hadith. So you can see on this chart you have basically three companions who narrate this hadith. There's a hundred companions. Then imagine how many branches go off from there. I mean thousands and thousands of narrations of this hadith. Now most of the versions, the version of Anas bin Malik and Abu Huraira and other companions say whoever lies about me intentionally, whoever misrepresents me intentionally, there's one version of the hadith narrated by the companion Abdullah ibn al-Zubair. It says, whoever misrepresents me, no mention of intention, let him prepare for himself a seat in hellfire. So you can see there's a big difference between this version and the other versions. Because that means that if I just accidentally misquote a hadith, or accidentally attribute something to the Prophet that he didn't say, that would actually earn me a seat in hellfire. Or that would be worthy of somebody who... Who, would, who deserves to be in hell. So you can see that, that there's actually a big distinction between these differences, so, uh, between these different narrations. So I'm not trying to say that, um, that these narrations, that because they're all reflections of some initial statement, original statement, that there's no differences. They're oftentimes very important differences. And so which version a scholar chooses can have a big legal impact or impact on theology or impact on the values we have as Muslims. But it's also very important because oftentimes you'll hear people say, that's a weak hadith. Or that hadith's not reliable. But what are they talking about? For example, I can tell you that this hadith here is unreliable, 
that this one is unreliable, that this one is unreliable, that this one's unreliable. Oops. Oops. Now I'm way off in another land. Um, but there's still this one here. There's still this this narration. So it's very comp hadith science is very complicated because it's very tricky to figure out when something is not something the Prophet said. Right? There are certain hadiths that everybody knows are made up. For example, there's a hadith that says uh, the a person from Africa, if they get hungry, they steal, and when they get full, they fornicate. This is completely made up. This is totally, totally made up. The Prophet never said this. No one ever said this. This was something that some racist made up and attributed to the Prophet because they wanted to promote their racist agenda. So th these things are, are baseless, right? And there's whole books in hadith criticism that deal with these baseless hadiths. Just list them all. For example, there's a... And some of them have really nice meanings. There's a, another hadith that says, Ra'sakuli uh, dhan bin hubbid dunya. Or hubbid dunya ra'sakuli khati'ah. Which is that the love of the wor er, this earthly world is the beginning of every sin. This is true. Right? This is very true. But it doesn't mean that the Prophet said it. And there's, we, can all, we can say we all hear wonderful things every day that the Prophet didn't say. It doesn't mean that they're not true. But there's also, it doesn't mean that, that it's a hadith. Right? So, but what I, the point is that when you get into hadiths that are um, found in hadith collections that Muslims deal with on a daily basis, it's a very difficult and very complicated thing to say, no, this is not a reliable hadith, because there are so many narrations of hadiths. You have to go back and make sure that each single one of them is not reliable in order to say that that hadith in general is not reliable. Uh, this is another uh, big question when we start thinking about hadith, which is, what is the... What, are, what is hadith as opposed to, we've all heard of sirah, the, fame, you know, the biography of the prophet. We've all heard of tafsir or Quranic commentary. And we've all heard of, of history, just the history of the caliphs, the history of the Umayyad caliphs, the history of the Abbasid caliphs, the history of the, the four rightly guided caliphs. So how does hadith fit in with these other genres of writing that we all know about? There's a couple of important distinctions. and I want to, This is a chart. I don't know if you guys can see this. I wish this were bigger. Maybe if I just push this back. Okay, I hope you... I, basically, the title at the top says Sources of Sirah and Hadith. Now, when Islam began, when the, the career of the Prophet began, a Arabs didn't have any written traditions. They didn't have a written tradition of history. They didn't have a written tradition of bureaucratic record-keeping. There was no courts. There was no government administration. Arabs just had basically poetry. And they had genealogy.